Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Uh, today I would like to explain what a category is, or as I would like to say it, arrows in action, because um, in a category what really matters are the arrows, which I would like to think of as relations between the whatever vertices, objects, whatever you would like to call them. So let me start with an example actually. So kind of one of the main examples of a category, the collection of sets. I will replace in the word collection in a second by category, so kind of kind of everything together is the category, whatever. Um, so there's a collection of sets. And what does a collection of set contains? Well, it contains sets, which I will call objects in a second. So we're just a set, like here is a set, um, the set one, two, okay? Just a set one, two, the set n of natural numbers, the set one, two, three, uh, a set which I haven't spelled out anymore and another set which I haven't spelled out anymore, X and Y. But the collection of sets, and that's kind of the point, also contains arrows, arrows. Here's an arrow, here's an arrow, here's an arrow, here's an arrow, and here's an arrow, for example. There are zillions of more arrows, of course. The collection of sets is a bit bigger than what I can draw on this slide. Uh, anyway, and those arrows in the setup are just maps, right? So here's an example of a map. So the, a map from one to two to n is, for, for example, given by this one. One goes to five, two goes to one. And well, you can have a map like this. One goes to one, two goes to three, which goes to this set. And you can have a map like this, two goes to 47 or whatever. And yeah, you also have something else here. It's not just a collection. It's not just a graph in some sense. It's not just a collection of vertices, sets, and arrows, maps but you can also compose arrows. And that's kind of the difference to, to a graph in the category. You can compose arrows, right? In this case here, this one is actually equal to the composition of those two if I haven't messed up. So let's see, one goes to one, one goes to five, should be one goes to five, perfect. I haven't messed up so far. Two goes to three, three goes to one, two goes to one, perfect. So this is actually a composition. So as I said, going this way is the same as going this way and going this way. So it's a little bit more than a graph, right? In a graph, you would have just this picture here um, and that's what it is, but you also have a rule of composition, right? So it's a little bit more than a graph. It's, it's a graph plus a rule of composition. And of course, in this set sense here, the graph can be huge because my vertices here are all sets and arrows are all maps. So this is a huge graph, but it doesn't really matter for the purposes of category theory, so you can, you can allow huge things. Strictly speaking, there are some set theoretical issues which I'm not touching at all, um, but let's just go with, you can kind of take everything you want as your objects and your morphisms uh, or maps and arrows. And you can really take everything you want. And the reason why I would like to use the map word arrow instead of the word map or morphism, which is also kind of a common in the literature is because of, well, a category can be kind of everything. It can be also the collection of one manifolds where an arrow is, is not a map, it's a manifold. So let me explain this collection of one manifolds. And I call it one cock. It's one of my main examples. It's one of my main non-concrete examples. I'm going to explain what concrete means a little bit later in this video. But what are the, well, it's a collection again. So it's a category, but what are the objects? Well, all the objects are points. So here I have, for example, one, two, three, four, five points. I'm not going to draw them anymore, but you have kind of five points here and a one point here. And what is an arrow? Well, it's just some way to connect up those points. So let me try to get this as in the picture. So I just connect it in some way, something like this. Um, I have messed up a little bit. The picture looks a little bit different, but the kind of there's a relation involved which says they are the same. Um, because they're kind of immersed manifolds in this case, whatever that means. So it's just a, a, a pictures, right? There's pictures between points. Those are your maps. Here's another example of a picture between points. So I got from three to five. And my map looks a little bit like this. I do this, 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 this. And I can have internal components like a circle, no problem. Okay, so my error here is very, actually very far away from being a map. It's just a picture. And it still is a category. Um, so I still have my arrows, my pair of pictures, my lines, whatever you want to call them. I still have them and I can still compose them. And the composition is kind of fun. So I can take my diagram here, so this one here, I can pull it a little bit downstairs, maybe here. I can take this diagram here, I can pull it a little bit upstairs and I can stack them together. And what I will get is a new diagram 
which starts now in three and ends in five, uh, ends in one, which is this composition diagram. It's exactly the same picture as for sets before. The arrow here is the arrow here composed with the arrow here. Just composed means something completely different than your, what you're used to from sets. And that's the power of category theory. So both of these are categories and fit into the same language. So let me repeat this one because it's important and I really like it. It's a, it's a category that I call one cop. So the objects, you can ident just identify them if you want with natural numbers. So here, three, one, five. So the vertices are just numbers and you should think of them as being points. So here, three, here's five. And this is an error from three to five. And it's just collect the dots, co collect the dots. This is an error from five to, to one. So you could compose an error from three to five with an error from five to one. And you get this piece here, which is an error from three to one, which is just stacked one of them on top of the other. And that's your composition rule, right? So in this picture, um, errors mean something completely different than in the set world. And as I said, the power of categories is that both of these are categories. Both of these fit into the same language. Amazing, really, really amazing that actually these very, very different looking examples are kind of the same type of object, if you want. I shouldn't say object in this context, but you get it. I'm not, I'm not mentioned, I don't want to say object in terms of the category, kind of thing, if you want. And this is kind of then the definition of a category. You just look at those two examples, so one manifold, so cop and set. So I should comment on the name in a second. Um, so it's called one cop because these things are called cobordisms, just the name. Anyway, it's just lines and points. If you want. Uh, so I have set and one cop. And what do they have in common? Well, they have objects and arrows. And I highlight the name arrows here because the arrows are the main players. Arrows, 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 main players, always in categories. The relations between things, right? You could think of a map as being a, uh, uh, think of a map as being a relation between the various uh, inputs here, uh, the various sets, and you can think of such a cobordism, such a manifold, as being a relation between three and five, for example. And what you then do is, yeah, you have objects and arrows. Perfect. So this is this collection. You have two kinds of inputs: objects not the important players, kind of the only there to really define the arrows, and you have the arrows. And you can compose them, and you have identities. So let me just, well, here the identity is kind of clear. It's an identity map. So if you go from one to whatever, from one, two, to one, two, you know how the identity map looks like. Of course, you only have identity maps if you have the same uh, source and target. It's just a map one to one and two to two. Um, you also have identities here. So what could it be? Let's say you go from two points to two points. So in the, in the composition, if you just think about it for a second, just a straight line diagram, so that's the identity. Because if you stack that to anything, um, it won't change the diagram you already have, right? So this has actually identities. Um, so both have identities. I kind of will often ignore them. And what I mean is, for example, instead of drawing this little picture where the loops indicate identities, I would just draw x, y, and the two non-trivial arrows. So kind of the identities are always around, so I kind of don't ignore them anyway. And so identities. So yeah, you have composition, great. You have identities, great. And whenever you have a type of composition, it would be better to have assertivity. So I kind of sign this with blood if you want, because assertivity just makes life so much easier. And in both cases, they actually do satisfy assertivity. Here it's a nice visualization exercise. And I think here it's kind of clear because you have seen it. Uh, a long time ago, um, which doesn't mean it's really obvious, you're just used to it, right? So I really recommend to try to do it here because um, as soon as you get used to that idea, it's actually also much easier, I claim, in the one cop picture than in the set picture. Um, anyway, and the only reason why it's not completely obvious to you maybe right now, why in one cop uh, a composition is associative, which is a stacking, is, well, because we haven't done it maybe. Um, and we're just very used to it. But anyway, associativity, yes, we sign that. That's important. We don't want to get, it just shouldn't get messy. Yes, 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 we want this. And then we just discovered, we just discovered the definition of a category. So the way to put um, one cop and set into the same setup, so set and one cop should go into the same setup. And the way we do this is, well, I just write it down, we go through it. It's not so important. I, basically, this slide already explains everything. But I wanted to write down a formal definition anyway. 
So what you would say is the category is actually a quadruple, blah, blah, blah. Nobody ever writes this quadruple out. But anyway, so we have a certain type of objects, we have a certain type of arrows, which you write down as hom. So homomorphisms, that's where the notation comes from, morphisms. And I put a little C down here, usually to make sure that these are arrows in C. I could have called them arrows again, um, but most, mostly in the literature you will see home, and I don't want to, anyone get to get confused. Anyway, so these are the set of arrows. And you have an identity arrow, right? This is identity for each object, which is the identity on that object. Um, you just don't call it the identity, you just call it the identity arrow. And you have a composition rule. And that's basically it. So this is a quadruple. Objects, arrows, identities, composition. So let's have a look again. Uh, objects and arrows, composition, identities, and associativity. Um, associativity, we haven't seen that so far. It's one of the conditions associated. Well, those datums should satisfy something. And yes, it should be, it should satisfy associativity. And of course, identities should be identities. Otherwise, you wouldn't call them um, by the names. And you want some, some condition on the home set, which is not super important anyway. So this is kind of the picture I would like to keep in mind. You have a graph with objects, vertices, and arrows, edges, or arrows, whatever you want to call them, and they have a composition rule such that they are identities and is associative. That's kind of what you have. Right? So and that's that's the notion of a category. Arrow can mean morphism or map, doesn't need to be uh, like in one form, for example. And the way you could think of it, of a category, um, I've written down three. I like the bottom one the most, but you are free to decide whatever you, whatever you like. A uh, category is like a set, but now you have arrows. It's not just a set would just be um, in this picture here, kind of this, 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 this collection of, of objects, of elements. But this is kind of the same. You have a collection of things, but you also have relation between the things. So it's like a set with arrows. Um, if you want to think of, Composition as kind of kind of multiplication law, and it's also like group, but now with many input, with kind of many um, start points because you have many objects that can just jump everywhere. It's like a huge graph with a composition rule um, along those lines. And you can also think of it like I have my little bubble here, and this is like my universe where everything takes place, and where really the arrows are the crucial players, and not not really the Vertices. So the arrows, which I would like to think of as being relations between things, the arrows matter, the arrows are very important. Okay, so I list just some examples. So category theory is just this ridiculously general theory that covers so many examples. And you kind of, as a kind of what I'd like to tell you about in the end is the power of category theory is it gives you a language to organize all of these various ideas from various fields under one umbrella which is extremely great, it's extremely powerful, and this is what, what makes category theory so useful and also in some sense so beautiful. So let me go through some of the examples. Always keep in mind that I would like to sell you the point that arrows are the main players, but somehow sadly, I will see that categories are mostly named after their objects. It's kind of, kind of historically, and there's no way to change it in some way. Uh, a little bit disturbing and a little bit annoying. Uh, one of the annoying facts of category theory. So actually, I said again, categories should be named after the arrows between the arrows are important and not so much the objects, but in the end, they're named after the objects for historical reasons. That's just what it is. Uh, we'll just go with the flow in order not to confuse anyone. And another point I would like to make before I go to the list of examples is they need not to be concrete. So they need not to be set based. Um, it's totally fine for a lot of examples to think of a category as being some form of sets, some form of maps, because we'll see several examples, but it doesn't need to be. Remember my one cop example, right? In one cop, it's not some form of sets and some form of maps, it was points and lines from something somehow completely different, right? So that's why I would like to keep the notion of arrow and not the notion of morphism kind of to distinguish it. It's, it's not a map, it's an arrow. It's a, co a combinatorial object that you can kind of stick together with other arrows. It's in a graph and you could stick it together. So here are some examples. Of course, the first ones that we've already seen, one of them is concrete, the other one is not. Um, and one cop, so um, object are zero manifolds, points, arrows are one manifolds, lines. It has a natural generalization to n cop, natural in the sense that, yeah, it makes sense, but not in the sense that you could really imagine it anymore, but anyway. Um, so it kind of the same idea. 
n manifolds and n minus one manifolds and n manifolds. Um, and again, this is a not this is a kind of a non-example. So it's not a set-based uh, category. And you can play a little bit around. So here's here are two examples, kind of the same flavor as the first one, but still different. So you can vary the uh, the objects, or you can vary the arrows. So F set, for example, has objects just all finite sets. So no infinite sets, um, but still all arrows are just maps. Um, you won't see infinite maps because they don't exist in this category because you don't have the right starting and endpoints. But otherwise, it's just all maps between finite sets. Um, the other one, P set, is slightly different. It has all sets, but only uh, so here you have all maps, here you have all sets, but only partial maps. So what is a partial map, for example? It would be a map from one, two to uh, one which just sends, for example, two to one, and you, it's, a partial, it's a partial map. You don't have any um, image for one, it's a partial map. You can take those and compositions of partial maps, of course, give you a partial map again. And yeah, so this is a variation of sets and they fit into the same framework um, and they're both concrete. You can also think of something like groups, topological spaces, topological spaces with certain types of other maps, all of them are set-based, vector spaces, uh, vector space is a really good example. K vector spaces for your favorite field K. So if you like R or whatever, so you can think of whatever R vector spaces or Q vector spaces, whatever your favorite field is. And the natural notion here of arrows would be linear maps. So all of these are kind of examples of, of yes, of concrete categories, set-based categories. But you can have, for example, matrices, which is kind of a model of VACT if you want, where the objects are just natural numbers. And um, the morphisms are just matrices, which is a very kind of funny way of thinking about it. It's kind of the concrete um, model of this category. So instead of having linear maps, you have matrices and you just write down a matrix and you don't really need to remember what kind of, um, it's only defined up to isomorphism. So you don't need to remember what kind of uh, vector space you start with. So you kind of only remember the dimension of this vector space. This is what you see here. And this is again, not set-based. It's kind of a fun example of a non-set-based um, categories. We'll see that um, a few times. Uh, but categories can also be very, very tiny. So all of them, are, these guys are very huge. They have infinitely many objects, um, for example. But you can have, it can be a finite graph. So you can have one vertex, you can just have one object and one arrow. So you always need an identity arrow, and that's the only one you have. And obviously, this is, this is kind of not concrete. It's not a very exciting category. It just has, it just, it's this category. It just has a point. Right? So, and, and I'm not even drawing this this uh, error anymore because it's there anyway. So it's kind of the point category, just one stupid point. And um, there's a star, and the star is what you see, what you see, and it's again a non-concrete uh, category. So let me have a look what star is. Star was this example. This actually is the category itself. Right? The objects are A, B, C, D, X, Y, and Z. The arrows are what you see. The identity arrows are the little loops. And I don't, and the kind of the composition rule is, is in, ex, in, um, implicit in this picture. And all of these are examples of categories and very different looking. Some of them look very similar, like finite sets and sets. Some of them look very different, like sets and cobordisms, matrices, funny finite categories, like just finite graphs and so on. And they all fit into the same language. Isn't that amazing? Um, yeah, so let me wrap up. So categories is this generalization of a notion of a graph, if you want. Um, this language using graphs and the, the really new notion here is that you can compose arrows, the composition of arrows. Arrows are the main players and how they compose, that's what makes a category a category. And yeah, there are just various, various, very different looking examples which all fit under the same umbrella, which makes the, the whole language so powerful. That's why I like it. And that's why I think, as I said, that it's really, really powerful. Anyway, I also hope you uh, enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.